We're talking about dying to live today. Dying to live today. Uh, point number one, identifying with Jesus' death. We are identifying with Jesus' death. And that is what baptism is about. Number two, reckoning yourself dead to sin. Reckoning, reckoning. And you have to understand reckoning is to know it is so. All right? Uh, in Oklahoma and in Arkansas, somebody asks you if you believe something and you say, I reckon so, all right? And what you're saying is, I believe it to be so. So reckoning yourself dead to sin. And folks, many people don't do that. I think this is a huge mistake we make in our Christian lives. And number three, presenting yourselves alive to God. Presenting yourselves alive to God. You know, after much teaching about man's sin and of God's redemption through Jesus Christ, Paul now moves to the subject of the believer's holiness and the practical application of being a Christian. After we as Christians are saved, we begin a spiritual journey of the true life we have in Jesus Christ. There are some specific things we need to do to truly grow as believers in Christ. God's Word gives us wonderful instructions of the importance of obeying and growing in the Lord. The typical religious Jew of Paul's days could not comprehend pleasing God apart from the strict adherence to the Mosaic law. And you have to understand, folks, we don't live under the law. We live under grace. And we know the law is good and it is important, but it is just a plumb line. It just shows us uh, when we mess up and when we sin. What they didn't understand is that a saving relationship with Jesus Christ enables you to have a holy life and holy living through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at this practical application found in Romans 6. And by the way, Romans 6 and 7, both chapters, they deal with sin. Okay, this, these next two chapters, we are going to uh, have probably uh, four different, this will be the first of four messages on how to deal with sin. So let's look at identifying with Jesus' death. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? He asked a question. And the Jews and the re religious leaders of those days had a lot of questions for Paul. And Paul knew what they were thinking. Okay, because he was a scribe, he was a Pharisee, he was raised under the law. So he could, in some ways, read their minds and know what they were anticipating and were thinking. And they thought he was throwing the law out, that it meant nothing to him, and he's not saying that. But the key in the last chapter, if you remember, folks, we live under grace. We, are, we have God's grace in God's mercy on our lives. I know me personally, if I didn't have the forgiveness of God, it would be hard for me to live a true Christian life. But he loves us. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. And I'm telling you here, he answers the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What some of them were saying, these Jewish leaders were saying, well, if that's the case about grace, then we ought to sin more. And folks, that is so illogical in the Christian world. Now, the world doesn't, you know, uh, when it comes to the world and sin, to a lost man, hey, I am what I am. It's no big deal when I sin. Everybody sins. We're all sinners. But I want to say this, folks. When I get saved, when I ask Christ to come into my life, he comes into the person of the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to sin. I don't. I know sin uh, comes in my life, and, it, and I'm convicted of my sin. But it's not a license to sin. We can't say, well, you know, and kind of chuckle it off and just say, hey, I'm just a sinner and I live under grace, so what? That's, that's what they are implying to what Paul is teaching. And Paul is answering the question here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. The King James says, God forget God, uh, you know, the King James says, uh, you know, I, man, I've lost it. <laughs> well, 
God forbid. Thank you, Betty. We've got our scripture quoter here. All right. I knew I had it on my tongue. God forbid. And look what he says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in? Folks, we shouldn't want to sin. We as Christians should get away from sin. We should do our best not to sin. And living under God's grace is not a license to sin. Because the other thing is not only did they use it as a license to sin, they used the law for legalism. Okay? And and both of those things are wrong in Christianity. Folks, we live under God's grace. Look at verse 3. Or do you not know that as many as... uh, Many of us, as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Just like Parker came up, and when he came in, all right, what he is saying when we are identifying with Christ, this is the old Parker, okay? And the old Parker needs to die. And I know Parker believes that. We talked about that. The, the way we were, the way he was, is no longer that way. We die to self. And we not only die to self, we die to sin. And he's going to explain that here, okay? And it says in verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism unto death that uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should uh, walk in the newness of life. Folks, this is a picture of what Jesus did when he was here in his life. He was crucified on a cross. That was his death. He was buried. He was put in a tomb. And on the third day, in just a few weeks, uh, we are going to celebrate Easter. He come out of that tomb. And I am telling you, Jesus is alive. He is at the right hand of God. And folks, that's what it means to identify with Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is. Because really you have two baptisms. When you get saved, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into your life, okay? And and He he quickens you. He makes you alive. You are not the same person. You are different. You are different. And that's why uh, when we look at water baptism, it is identifying us with Jesus' death. Literally, baptism means immerse in water. And people ask me, and they have asked me, why do we immerse? Why can't we sprinkle? Because Jesus was baptized. If you just go back to the first part of the gospel, Jesus went into the Jordan River. John the Baptist didn't sprinkle water on him. He immersed him. He took him totally under. And folks, I'm telling you the trinity that was there. If we had time, we would go back there. God the Father said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. Jesus gave this as an example for us. That was identifying not only with Jesus, but with the New Testament church. That's why we ask you to be baptized after your professions of faith. It identifies you with Jesus. It identifies you with with the church. And then the Holy Spirit. The Bible says uh, a dove from heaven came. Jesus went up at his death. And the Holy Spirit at his baptism came down. And that was what happened in the early church, folks. It was the Holy Spirit. Hold your finger there and go with me to John chapter 11. John 11. And we know the story of John 11. Mary and Martha were good friends of Jesus, and Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus. Lazarus was sick, and they you know, got word to Jesus. He was, he was away, and he just said, man, your friend Lazarus is sick, even sick unto death. Come quickly, come now. And the Bible says, and even the disciples in the early, early verses there just did not know why Jesus uh, tarried. But folks, Jesus has a purpose for everything. He knows what he's doing. And after four days, I mean, Lazarus died, and he had been in the tomb four days when Jesus arrived. Now look at verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. 
Martha went to see him. Mary had it in attitude, okay? Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. She is showing faith. She was disappointed in his death, but she was showing faith there. Then Jesus said unto her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he will arise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, she had faith in God. She had faith in Jesus, but he was talking about the present time. She was talking about the future time. And folks, we are going to be resurrected. Uh, We are. The dead in Christ will rise. But verse 25, and he said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And I'm, I know Martha was just thinking, what are you talking about? Okay, what are you, what, what, what are you saying? I know he's going to arise later on, but look what he says. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Oh, folks, I don't know about you, but I'm going to live forever. I'm going to live forever. And I understand death. We, we have to shed ourselves of this body. This body is not fit for heaven. Matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood will not see heaven. But he was talking about he will live right now. Right now. And it says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said unto him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Why did Jesus delay? Because folks, he could have healed him. Matter of fact, he could have healed him from where he was at. He'd done that before. He didn't have to be there to heal him. But he wanted everybody to know that he, Jesus, is the resurrection and life, and he has power over death. Jesus I mean, he walked up to that tomb, and he said, open the tomb. One of the girls said, "Uh, Jesus, we we need to think about this. He's been in there four days. He stinketh, is what he said, she said. And Jesus called forth his name, and he wrapped, wrapped in cloth, came out alive. Oh, folks, we're we're not serving a dead Savior here, folks. He raised Lazarus to life. That is the kind of power it is. That's what salvation is. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, and he made you alive through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see identifying with Jesus' death. But the second thing I want to see you to see is reckoning yourself dead to sin. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Because Jesus rose, we will rise one day. Matter of fact, i tell you what I'm holding out for, and folks, I think it's coming. I'm not predicting this, but I am telling you with all the signs and everything in place, it would not surprise me if Jesus came and the rapture of the church came in 2022. It would not surprise me. And folks, if we have died, if we have been made alive through Christ, that should not scare us. He showed victory over death, and because Jesus showed victory over death, we will arise. We will live forever. And I just assume we all go out together. Instead of one at a time, you know, let's just go. If he came today, now I want to finish my sermon, okay? I mean, we got to finish church here. But still, if he interrupted us and we went out, would that not be the best day of your life? Amen. Now look what he says. The Bible says, knowing this, that's what reckoning means. You know it, that our old man was crucified with him. See, when you get saved, you still have your old nature. 
Let me ask you a question and don't answer it out loud. Did you sin once this week? Did you sin twice this week? Is not everybody in here a sinner? And when you ask Christ to come into your life, He doesn't purge you of your old nature. But this, it's a picture. If our heart was in there and our life was full of sin, folks, I'm telling you, that new nature He places inside of you, the more you grow, the more you glow, the more you uh, uh, read the Word of God, the more you serve God, the more you obey God, you are just pushing that old nature out of your heart. And that's what he's saying, folks. We have been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Go with me there. Galatians 2.20. I love this scripture. Galatians 2.20. Well, if I get there, I think I'll just read it up here. I have been crucified with Christ. Why? His death. His death, his death paid for my sins. It is not no it is not no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Folks, I'm dead. I am dead to sin. I am dead to sin is what he is saying. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. This is my flesh, okay? And I still have the old nature in me. But folks, what we have to do is we have to die to self. This is the key to overcoming sin. It's no longer, I do what I want to do. I do it my way. I do it or else. Folks, it is surrendering your total person to God. It is saying, I'm, I'm no longer uh, uh, running my own life. I have died to self. I still have my old nature. I need to, I need to uh, you know, feed that new nature. And that new nature is the love of Jesus Christ. In the life I which now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Folks, we have to die to self. To have victory over sin, we have to die to self. Now look back in Romans knowing this, verse 6, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Do you not realize you don't have to sin? You really don't. As a Christian, you will not be perfect because of your old nature. And by the way, you will have your old nature until you take your last breath. Okay? It's going to be. Now, it can just be a little bitty old spot there. But folks, I've seen good, good Christians. I've seen them, their, their tempers flare. I've seen them gossip. I've seen them do things. But he's saying our old nature, it just needs to get smaller and smaller. And, smaller. and how does it get smaller? Folks, I'm telling you, when we die to self, when we die to self, we are free from sin. We are free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Folks, Christ lives forever, and we will live forever. Death no longer has dominion over him. And you think about it, folks. You're looking at a dead man here. I, hey, I need to die to myself. I need to die. Let me ask you this. What influence has sin over a dead man. Zero. Zero. I mean, and again, I'm not trying to be morbid here, but I'm simply saying, if a man is dead, he will not respond to sin. And if we are alive in Christ, we have power over sin. I can't tell you how many people, and folks, normally it's one or two things in their lives that they just can't get victory over. I've counseled, I've talked, I've given them scripture, I've done everything, and they just says, they say, I just can't get victory over it. Folks, we need to read Romans chapter 6. According to the Word of God, you can be free from sin. Not perfect, but free from sin. And it says, verse 10, For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to 
God. Folks, I am telling you, let me, let me put it another way. We all have choices. We have the freedom of choice. And we have to choose not to sin. It is a choice. And the reason we should know when we sin is because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in our lives, and it's telling you, and, and folks, I do it. I'll say something, and as soon as I say something, I'll, I'll think, oh, you probably shouldn't have said that. And if you'll do business with God right then, see, some of the mistakes we make is we don't do business with God right then. We, we, we you know, just act like, well, it wasn't that bad of sin. Okay, you know, I'm not murdering anybody. I'm not committing adultery. I don't do none of the bigs. But folks, sin is just sin. And sin hurts your walk with the Lord. It really does. And so today, it ought to excite us to know that we don't have to sin. We have freedom in Jesus Christ just to fall into His lap, just to get in His lap and say, Jesus, man, I need some help here. I got this one sin, and I just can't get it out of my life. I, I've been doing this for years, and I want it to stop. And the Scripture says we can be free if we will die to self. Colossians 3. Go with me to Colossians. Colossians 3, verse 5. Colossians 3, verse 5. Therefore... Put to death your members which are here on earth. Put them to death, folks. All right, not your physical body. Okay, we're talking about your sin. Your I wants to. Your, hey, I don't care what anybody thinks. Well, folks, you should care what God thinks. Okay, His Word is there. You should care about your testimony. Okay, you should care about holiness and walking with God. But we have to put to death our members which are on earth. And he just lists them, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these th things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Folks, God punishes for our sins. He tells us, as Christians, we get punished, all right, in Hebrews. Why? <coughs> Excuse me. The same reason we punish our children. When our children disobey us, we punish them. Why? So they'll do the right thing. And that's what it's talking about. Now look at verse 7. In which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. Before you were saved, you didn't think about it. It wasn't that big a deal. But now that you are saved, folks, everything changes. Now look at verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And folks, the old man is that old self. It is the old self uh, in your life. And have, look at verse 10, put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. I put my old man off. That sin nature, those bad choices, it's like a pair of clothes. I take them dirty clothes off, and folks, I don't put those clothes on anymore. And I put on that new nature. Who is the in image of him? Notice that it's capitalized, capital H. Folks, it's Jesus. We put on Jesus. All right, we don't literally put it on. The Holy Spirit is inside of us, but Jesus is example. Matter of fact, folks, all we have to do is ask ourselves. I was teaching a men's group yesterday, and one of the three things that we have to do with, to walk with the Lord is ask ourselves this question: What would Jesus do if Jesus, if you put off the old man and you put Jesus on? That's all you have to do. You can ask yourself. And you will know, and the Holy Spirit will tell you what you should do. Then it says in verse 11, uh, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. Folks, a goal in our Christian's life should be to be Christ-like. 
be Christ-like. And folks, I know we're not perfect. Nobody is perfect. Jesus was the only perfect being. But I am telling you, we don't have to sin. I, that should excite you. That should give you a goal in your life. That should give you, uh, you know, something and a marker to say, you know, you know, I wake up and today, you know what my goal today is? I'm going to try not to sin. I am going to do my best not to sin. And if you sin, 1 John 1 9 says, you know, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all righteousness. When you sin, take care of it right then. Because two things will happen. One is you, you will forget that you sin, and, and God hasn't forgotten that. The second thing is when we forget that we sin, that wall of separation, the more we sin, the easier it is to sin. And that wall, now you're still a Christian. That relationship never changes. But your fellowship with God changes. So one key to walking with God is reckoning yourself dead to sin. I'm a dead man, folks, and I don't mind being a dead man. I live more for Christ when I die to myself. Matter of fact, when you think about heaven, I'm already there. I'm already there. Folks, when I got saved, my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Nothing can take that away. Now, I'm still here, and I'm still living, and I'm going to still serve the Lord, but I've made a, revel a re reservation, and that res reservation is in heaven. So the third thing we want to see, not only identifying with Jesus' death, reckoning yourself dead to sin, but presenting yourself alive to Christ. Look at verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon, there's that word again, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, I'm alive. Now, again, you can see that I'm alive. I can see that you are alive. But folks, there are a lot of people that have no hope. There are a lot of people that have no purpose in life. There are a lot of people, matter of fact, sometimes, even at church, I'm looking at some people and I'm thinking, man, somebody done licked the red off your sucker. I mean, you, you look so sour. It's just like, you're a Christian? You know, I'm, I'm just thinking, what, what, why, why? Okay, folks, I believe with all my heart, knowing these two things, we ought to be the happiest people on the face of this earth. When you know these things, and we are made alive to Christ. Look at verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Folks, take care of sin. Take care of sin. Verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Nothing, okay? Nothing. Your mind, do not let it sin, okay? Your eyes say, I am not going to sin with my eyes today. My mouth, I am not. That's, that's our, our bodies, okay? I'm not going to sin with my mouth. With my attitude, I am not going to sin today, all right? It's like the guy that has a flat, you know, and he comes out and looks at the tire, and he's going to be late for work, and he kicks the tire. Now, what does that do? What good does kicking the tire do? Okay? Hey, it's life. It happens. Call your boss. I'll get there as soon as I can. And keep that joy of the Lord in your heart and in your life. Look at verse 13. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Unrighteousness is sin. Righteousness is following God. In what you present your members, your attitude, what you do in life, how you, how you look at things, your perception, whether you have a quiet time. Folks, I have said this and I'll keep saying it. Every growing Christian spends time in God's Word every day. You've got to get in the Word every day. Now look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So he says it again. 
We're not under the law. We are under God's grace. Folks, there is victory over death and there is victory over sin for the Christian. We will not die that second death. All right, We are going to live forever with Jesus Christ. And we, not only, that's, that's the future, but even today, we don't have to sin. We can have victory over sin. 1 Thessalonians 5. We'll wrap this up. 1 Thessalonians 5. This is so important. This is where the rubber hits the road, okay? This is how we practice yielding to God. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. Folks, find something good every day. Find good in a bad situation. Rejoice. You are up. You are walking. You are breathing God's air. He awoke you today. And here's what I say about rejoicing. I don't care what situation you are in, folks. There's always someone worse off than you are. Always. Rejoice. Always. Pray without ceasing. Folks, we need to pray about everything. We're talking about how to walk with the Lord, how to be a spirit-filled Christian. Pray without ceasing. Be in an attitude of prayer. The third thing, in everything, give thanks. Be thankful every, every day. Bless all your meals. When you're out eating, thank God for your meals. That is a testimony to people around you. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We should be thankful for all He gives me. The next one, do not quench the Spirit. How do we quench the Spirit with sin? When there's sin in our lives, there is a quenching of the Spirit. Get as far away from sin as you can. Next, do not d despise prophecies. What's prophecies? Preaching. Preaching. It's like, you know, I agreed with most of what you said. Well, folks, all I'm doing is reading you the Bible. You need to agree with all I say. And if I'm wrong, you come to me and let me know, but I'm reading the Word of God. Take it up with God. All right? He'll win that argument. I'll tell you that right now. Do not despise prophecy. 21, test all things. How do we test things? Two test. Number one, the Holy Spirit. Is my spirit bearing witness with this? Number two, the, whole, uh, the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about it? Those are tests. Folks, I'm telling you, we're tested every day. And sometimes we are blinded. We don't, you know, there's pop quizzes. Something just pops into our life and we're not sure how to react. Folks, you call upon the Holy Spirit. You find out whether this, and by the way, if Satan promised you something, you know, if it's, it's a, you, you're just not going to believe this. You're just not going to. Folks, don't believe it. Okay, Satan is a liar. He makes things better than they really are. Don't take the bait, but test all things. Hold fast to what is good. That's, that is righteousness. Hold fast to righteousness. And here is one of my life verses. Abstain from every form of evil. Abstain means avoid every form of evil. And I'll say this also. When in doubt, do without. If you're not sure, don't do it. Just don't do it. And you can present yourself alive to God. The last scripture, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And we all know the huge sin that David committed. He did commit the sin of adultery. He did commit the sin of murder. And he penned these verse, Psalms 51. And I'm telling you, he lived with his sin for one whole year. And finally, it just got the best of him. The conviction just fell upon him. And he started confessing his sin. And you can read all of Psalm 51, but I just want to clue in on verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Oh, folks, there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There is no sin that you have committed that God cannot forgive you of. And two things 
we have trouble doing. Sometimes we have trouble forgiving ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves. And sometimes we have trouble forgiving others. And when we have these two problems, folks, I'm telling you, we are not dealing with sin the way the Word of God tells us to deal with sin. Folks, I believe with all my heart there are some defeated Christians out there because they will not forgive someone that has done them wrong. They have done something wrong, and even in their prayers they say, God, I do this, 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 and this right. i just got this one thing. Folks, I'm telling you, they don't have the joy of their salvation in their lives. Father, thank You for the day. And God, I thank You so much for Your Word, and I thank You for the book of Romans. God, I thank You that, Lord, uh, we can be free. We can not have to worry about death. We can accept You into our lives. And we can, by faith, uh, take the grace of God. Thank You for sending Jesus to die for our sins. Thank You, Lord, that He shed His blood for everyone. And God, I pray if there's one here today that doesn't know You, that doesn't have a personal relationship with You, God, I pray that they would come forward and make a profession of faith today. God, it could be the first day of the rest of their life. It could be the happiest day of their life. So God, we give You this invitation. God, it's You. It's Your Spirit. It's Your church. And God, I pray for the Christian. There are Christians here that are living defeated lives. And God, I, I truly believe after this sermon, they know it. You have illuminated Scripture. You have showed them they don't have victory over sin. They don't have that joy that they had when they first got saved. So God, I pray that they would be like David and they would repent of their sins. and They would rededicate their life to Christ. And God, for some, they may need to do that publicly also. And Lord, if there's candidates for baptism, people have been saved and never have followed the Lord in baptism or even joined the church. God, this is your church. This is your time. If, if you tell them to come and be a part of this church, we would just rejoice with them. So God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your love. Thank You for Your invitation. You say it all the time in the Word of God. Come. Just come. Come, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There are people that need that in their lives today. So I pray they would come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?